Please take your Bibles and turn once again to Luke chapter 7. One more time, I'll read Luke 7, verses 36 to 50. This is the account that we've read uh, two Lord's Days ago and then again this morning. The account of the sinful woman whose sins were forgiven. And as I thought about the ministry of the word tonight, I thought this is certainly a fitting passage for a Christian baptism. So I'll read once again the last part of Luke 7, beginning at verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain debt creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Let's once again ask God for his help as we come to the ministry of his word this evening. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word, and we believe what the scripture says about itself, that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we ask that you would show that this evening by causing your word to come with power to the heart of everyone who is here. May Christ be glorified, especially as we think of this joyous occasion of the baptism of a sister in Christ and two people being added to the church of Christ because of their faith in him. So hear our prayers now and be with us and bless us as the word is proclaimed, for we ask it all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, there is a sense in which this is a very fitting passage for a Christian baptism. Every Christian can testify to the fact that he or she came into this world a sinner and is a sinner that needs salvation by God's grace. And every proper candidate of Christian baptism is someone who can say, I have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. I've been forgiven of all my sins through the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And every Christian can say just what we saw in this woman's life in the days of the Lord Jesus, that because of their sins being washed away by the blood of Christ, they are indebted to him. And therefore, they love him and want to manifest their love to the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the ways that's done, of course, is through testifying to God's grace in the ordinance of baptism. Well, it's fitting then for the baptism of Melissa Honeywell and then also for the reception of her and her husband Stephen into this church that we start out with this text tonight because they can testify of these very things, that they are sinners who have been forgiven through the grace of God and by the blood of Jesus Christ and that they are indebted to him for that and that because of that they love him with all their hearts. Well, what I want to do this evening is not expound this text as I've already done a couple of times, at least once and then in part once again. But what I want to do this evening is simply cover three headings as I have time. I'll certainly at least get to the first, and that's this. Paul's explanation of this saving grace. We see the saving grace of God here in this text, that here is this sinful woman, even though she was really a very sinful woman. She had a reputation in the town where she lived as a sinner. Jesus was not a resident of that town, but Simon the Pharisee who lived in that town knew who that woman was, and he thought if Jesus really was a prophet of God, he would know as well. Well, Jesus did know, and he knew a lot more than Simon knew as well. But here was this sinful woman who was forgiven. And so I want to begin with an explanation of this saving grace, how this woman's sins were washed away. And we see that not in Luke chapter 7, but over in Romans chapter 3. So please, if you have a Bible in front of you, turn to Romans 3, and I will read Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. In Luke chapter 7, we could say, here's a real-life illustration of a woman whose sins were forgiven. Well, in Romans 3, Paul gives us an explanation of how it is that people's sins can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. So let me just read this brief paragraph, beginning at verse 21. The Apostle Paul writes, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Well, we could say Paul has said a mouthful there. It's just uh, two sentences in the Bible version that I've read from. But he said a lot in those couple of sentences. But we don't need to understand every single thing he said. I just want to explain the grace of God and the way that he forgives sinners as Jesus forgave that immoral woman there on that day at the house of Simon. And first of all, what we see in this text is every sinner's dilemma. Or we could put it this way. We see your dilemma, your dilemma and mine, as we come into this world. And that dilemma is that we are sinners. It says in verse 23 of Romans 3 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the teaching of the Bible. Paul spent a good amount of time in the first two and a half chapters of the book of Romans 
especially just immediately prior to this paragraph that we come to, establishing how the Bible teaches that everyone who comes into this world is a sinner. No, Adam and Eve were not when they first came into this world, and of course Jesus Christ was not when he came into this world, but besides them, everyone who has come into this world has been a sinner. A sinner who, as it says, has fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. People are different in their sins. Some people don't have the same sins that other people have. Some people look down on people who have different sins, and those other people's sins look really ugly to them. And they comfort themselves by saying, well, at least I don't sin in the way that person does. But here's God's view. Your sins may be different. They may not be as outwardly ugly as some people's sins, but you're a sinner nevertheless. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You may not be as sinful as that woman mentioned there who stood out the way she did, but think of it this way. Even though that woman stood out the way she did, she had her sins forgiven through Jesus Christ. All have sinned, though, and fall short of the glory of God. We like to look at God as being in heaven, which is true, and we think of heaven as being up there somewhere, way up there. Well, look at it this way. All have sinned, and because of that, they fall short of the glory of God. You can never attain heaven because you are a sinner. At least you can never attain it by your own works. You can never, ever be good enough. That is your dilemma. Now, you could look at it this way. They have those lotteries out there, Powerball, Mega, whatever. I don't know the names of all of them. But every, I hear the announcements like you do. It's up to $293 million and so on. Everybody's at the convenience store buying a ticket and all that. People go in there and they all look at it this way. We're not going to attain it. We're all going to fall short of the mega millions, but let's give it a shot. It's something like that, but it's really far worse than that. Because you can fall short of winning the Powerball and still have a rel relatively decent living, can't you? You can go home to a nice home, nice automobiles, maybe even a swimming pool in the backyard. That's not the way it is here. If you fall short of the glory of God, there's only one thing awaiting you at the end of this life. And that is what the Bible calls wrath, the wrath of God. He's going to pour out his anger on you in the place called the lake of fire. That's why this is a dilemma, that you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is a day of judgment coming, as the Bible says, that we will all one day die, and after that, the judgment. In other words, no second chance, no returning to the platform on which you once sinned and trying to get it right next time. No do-overs. That's your dilemma. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that leads in the second place to your helplessness. Look at verse 21. It says, now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. There is a way to have your sins removed, as it happened with that woman, and to be clothed with the very righteousness of God, the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. But it tells us here, if it's going to happen, it will happen apart from the law. In other words, God has given a law that tells you exactly what he requires of people. He requires that they love him with all their heart and soul and strength and mind and love their neighbor as themselves. But you can never, ever attain to that. You cannot keep the Ten Commandments. Even if you can keep them outwardly, you'll covet in your heart or you'll do something from a selfish motive. You cannot do it. That's why Paul says the righteousness of God only comes apart from the law. You are utterly helpless to 
when it comes to the whole idea of saving yourself. You cannot do it. And if you've ever thought, I don't think I'm good enough to do that, you're exactly right. And that's what the Bible is saying here. The righteousness has to come apart from the law. But here's the other thing that impresses upon us our own helplessness. That is that we cannot save ourselves. And that is that the Bible says here, if we are saved, it will only be by the grace of God. It will only be by the gift of God given to us. Look at verse 24. It says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That is, if someone is justified, if he's given a right standing before God, his sins are removed from his account before God, and he's clothed with the righteousness of Christ, how it will, will it happen? It will only happen freely. That is, not because of what he did, but only because God is merciful to him and gives him that right standing before him. It happens freely by His grace. And that's what grace means. You cannot justify yourself. You cannot earn your salvation. It only comes as a free gift from God. You are utterly helpless to save yourself. And that leads to the next thing we see in this passage, and that is your only hope. There's only one hope. As I said, it's not that you would be good enough. It's not, even if you're still a very, very young person, it's already too late to try to do it right from here on out because you've already sinned enough to be worthy of hell. Your only hope is one thing. And you might be tempted to think there's no hope because I've just said you cannot accomplish your salvation. But there is hope. Your only hope is Jesus Christ. That's what that woman sensed. She knew her sins had been forgiven, and she sensed her indebtedness to Jesus Christ. And that's why she stood behind him and wept. And when her tears fell on his feet, she wiped them, wiped the feet with her hair, and then she anointed them with perfume and kissed them. That was her way of showing her gratitude to Christ because she understood it was because of Jesus Christ she didn't understand all that Paul wrote here necessarily, but she did understand that her only hope was Jesus. And that's your only hope. Notice it in verse 22. It speaks of this righteousness that is given to sinners, and it says, even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ that someone's sins can be washed away and he can be made righteous in Christ. Or look at verse 24 again. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is only to be found in him. As the apostle said in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. There is no other hope for salvation outside of the Christian gospel, and that means outside of Jesus Christ himself. He is your only hope. And look at the beginning of verse 25 as well. Having mentioned Christ Jesus, at the end of verse 24, it says in verse 25, whom God set forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now it says in verse 24 that there is a redemption in Christ Jesus. It says in verse 25 that he is made a propitiation by his blood. It says later on in that verse that it demonstrates the righteousness of God. Here's the point. I'll try to make it simple. The point is this. God does not save people by suddenly deciding, you know, I think I'll be nice to some of these terrible sinners. And then just kind of wink at their sin and pretend it never happened. Sometimes maybe you've done that as a parent. 
you thought at first that kid really deserves strong discipline, but then you've said later, ah, I just don't feel like it today. And that's in effect what you did. But that's not what God did. It says there is a redemption in Christ Jesus. In other words, people were in bondage to sin. A price had to be paid to get them out, and that price was the life of Jesus Christ. If you're a saved sinner, you're only saved because you were redeemed by the price of his life. And the reason is because it says that God wanted to demonstrate his righteousness. In other words, he says, I'm not going to just wink and pretend the sin never happened. He says, I'm a God of justice and righteousness. As the Bible says, every sin, every transgression is going to be punished. And the gospel says it doesn't have to be punished in you. It can be punished in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's why he became a man. And Paul says in verse 25, he became a man so he could be a propitiation by his blood. A propitiation means this. God was angry with sinners. And he wasn't going to forget about his anger against sin. He was going to vent his wrath against sin. Now, as I said... Some people, he vents his wrath against their sin by punishing them in hell forever. That's how bad our sins all are. They deserve that kind of a punishment from an eternal and holy, perfectly holy God. But he made Jesus a propitiation, and that means this. For the people in whose place he stood, God's wrath was vented against their sins. He didn't hold it back at all. He poured it out in full. But where he poured it out was on Jesus Christ. And he did that especially as Christ hung on the cross. The greatest suffering he endured was not the mocking that people gave him, not the way they lashed his back or stuck a crown of thorns in his head and mocked him and spit on him or the nails that they drove into his hands and his feet or the spear that went into his side or all the agony physically that he endured through the terrible, terrible death of a first century Roman crucifixion. The greatest agony he endured was that his father was pouring out his righteous wrath against sin on him as he hung on the cross. And when it says he's a propitiation, that means God did it in your place if you're a Christian so that you will never, ever have to go through such agony. As Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken by his Father so that these words will always be true of you if you're a Christian. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And when his sacrifice on that cross was finished, he was propitiated. That is, he was, his wrath was pacified. His justice was fully satisfied so that ugly a sinner as you may ever have been, if you are covered in the blood of Christ, there is no wrath left in God for you. Period. Amen. That's how that woman's sins were forgiven. And that leaves just one point then from Paul's explanation, and it's this. Your one assignment. You can't save yourself. You could never be good enough. Your one assignment is this, and that is to believe in Jesus. If you understand from the Scripture, from the law of God, from the Spirit of God working in your heart that you are a sinner, here is your one assignment. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. As it says in verse 22, even the righteousness of God which is through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. You might say, well, but I I've, I've, I've haven't been to church all my life. You know what it says? It says, to all who believe. You say, well, but I'm a terrible sinner. That's why we started with that immoral woman in that town. There is no sinner too terrible to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. There isn't. Amen. 
It's through faith in Christ, and that's what the Bible calls you to do, believe. Cut through all those arguments, forget about them tonight, and believe in Jesus, as it says there in verse 25, whom God said forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith. Through faith. You need to believe in Jesus Christ, and that's all the Bible calls you to do. To know the blessedness and the bliss of having all your sins washed away. There's Paul's explanation of this grace that that woman experienced in Luke 7. Let me go on at least to the second thing then. And that is baptism's illustration of this grace. Baptism's illustration of this grace. Baptism, which we saw a little bit earlier, illustrates the saving grace of God. As far as we know, this immoral woman in Jesus' day was never baptized. Maybe she was baptized later on by one of the apostles, but we don't know that. Maybe she was baptized by John the Baptist, but we don't know that. But we do know this. If you are a believer in this day and age, you're called to be baptized, to make that good profession that Melissa made earlier this evening. And when she was baptized, that water did not wash her sins away. And there is no power in me as a gospel preacher that I could pronounce her sins washed away upon the act of baptism. Baptism doesn't save, but as I said, baptism illustrates this saving grace of God. Remember what it says there in Romans chapter 3, it is through faith. Faith that people are given the righteousness of God, that their sins are washed away. It's your faith that Jesus said saved the woman. As it says here in Romans 3, it is the work of Christ that is received through faith. But let's turn over to Romans 6 and just briefly look at Romans 6, the first seven verses. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now this says a lot more than I'm going to say in just a few minutes remaining to me tonight. But one of the things this says, and one of the ways that baptism illustrates salvation through Jesus Christ is this, that baptism tells us something about the fact that there is new life for sinners in Jesus Christ. There is new life in Christ. First of all, it tells us that when someone becomes a Christian, that his, he has been given spiritual life. He's been translated from a state of spiritual death to a state of spiritual life. He's undergone, undergone a transformation within, we could say. And the way it's illustrated in baptism is this. Christ died and was buried, and then he rose from the dead. Now that's kind of pictured in baptism. That's why we put the person under the water, and raise them up again. We don't leave them under the water, for which they're all thankful. <laughs> but that's what it pictures. Death in Christ rising again to newness of life. What it's saying is this. Christ died and rose. You believe in him as a Christian. That means then, because of your being united to him through faith, you died and rose. Look at verses 5 and 6. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, 
that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. A real change has gone on within the soul of every genuine Christian. When someone becomes a Christian, it's not just that they're turning over a new leaf, as we say, or they've been given some kind of a new lease on life, or now they have a new way of looking at life. All those things are true, but it's far more than that. And it runs far deeper than that. They've been made a new creature in Christ. There is, there is now spiritual life where there had only been death before. But also there's a change in life that follows from that. Look at the last part of verse 4. It says that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If someone says, I'm a Christian, he should live differently now. His old habits should be behind him. Not that he may never fall into them again. Or have to struggle with the same sins that he did before. But here's the point. He does now fight against them. And because the Spirit of God was in, is within him, he does gain the victory over those things. It may be gradual. It may be painfully slow. But he does it by the grace and power of God, so that we can say the chains are broken. There's a new life. There's a change in the life. For the end of verse 6, likewise, it says, so that we should no longer be slaves of sin. We saw it in Jesus' words in Luke 6, verse 44, recently. Every tree is known by its fruit. That's true of that woman there in Luke chapter 7. Her life was no doubt very, very, very different. I know that some churches, when people are baptized, they don't simply kind of talk them through a confession of faith like I did, but they actually have people get up and give a personal testimony, even tell things about what their life was like and what God has done to change them. And I'm sure if we had had Melissa do that tonight, I'm sure if we had Steve stand up and do that tonight, you would hear things that would make you say how true this is, about how God changes the lives of sinners to his glory. But that's the gospel message. God gave them faith in their hearts. He washed away their sins. And now their life must be different. Because like that woman in Luke chapter 7, they love the Lord who has done all these things for them. It cannot but be different. And then, let me just mention the last thing I was going to say since we're also having the Lord's Supper tonight. And that is that the Lord's Supper also illustrates this saving grace. Let me just read the passage that I had in mind. It's John chapter 6, verses 47 to 51. John 6, verses 47 to 51. Here we have the words of the Lord Jesus, and he says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. We'll have bread that we eat as part of the Lord's Supper tonight. It says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. What does that bread represent when we eat it tonight? Well, Jesus said it represents his flesh, which he would give for the life of the world. When did he do that? He did that when he hung on the cross. And the Father's wrath was poured upon him in the place of his, his people that he was representing, sinners. He gave his flesh for their lives. This is the gospel represented in the Lord's Supper. Christ died, 
When you eat that bread, that's a representation of what? Faith in Him. It is a very intimate act to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You take Him, in a sense, into your soul. He becomes a part of you, you become a part of Him. As He says, abide in me and I in you. And so eating and drinking are very fitting to represent saving faith in Christ. You chew that bread, you swallow it, you digest it, it becomes a very part of your being. That's the gospel in a sense. And what we're testifying when we drink that bread, or we eat that bread and drink that cup, is that because of Jesus Christ, and only because of Jesus Christ, we have life. Just like we can all say, we'll live till tomorrow because we had food today. In a physical way, we live spiritually because of what Christ did for us and because of our taking hold of him by faith. That is the testimony of every single Christian here tonight who will take the Lord's Supper. His testimony is, I was a wandering Aramean in a sense, as it says in the Old Testament. In other words, a nobody, not one of God's people, but God, in his mercy and his good pleasure, looked down upon me, laid hold of me by his Spirit, washed away all my sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, and made me his child. That's what we're testifying when we eat at this table tonight and when we drink. And we're testifying that it is all and only because of Jesus Christ and his blood shed for us. And the rest of our testimony is this. Though you may not believe in him, and though you may be a terrible sinner like that immoral woman, yet if you believe, the same will be true of you as well. Your sins will be washed away, and you will be welcomed one day into everlasting glory by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so I urge you, even if you came in here tonight, apart from God and outside of his grace, that you would believe in him, that you might be saved. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, this gospel of good tidings, that there is forgiveness of sins, even sins of the greatest number and of the deepest die through the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that we who believe in Jesus can testify as we sang earlier today in the morning service that there have I, as vile as the thief who hung on the cross next to Jesus, there in that fountain open for all uncleanness have I as vile as that thief, washed all my sins away. Father, help us as we come to the Lord's table tonight to revel in that gospel truth and in the forgiveness of our sins through Christ and cause some who have not known him to believe in him this very night. For we ask this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.